What's up, gentlemen? This is Rising Phoenix Podcast, the podcast about how to rise up after your divorce. I'm your host, Michael Rhodes. Let's get into it. Joining me today is Dr. Asael. Uh, Asael, let's just jump right into it and want to tell us a little bit about yourself. So hi, my name is Asael Romanelli. I'm 44 years old, married to Galit, who's a coach and a PhD in gender studies. We have two kids. I'm a social worker. I'm a couple and family therapist and supervisor. I train couple and family therapists. My PhD is in improv in therapy because I also deal a lot with theater improvisation, playback theater, and psychodrama. And together with my wife, I run the Potential State Institute for Enriching Relationships, where we combine the worlds of therapy, art, and education to help people enrich their relationships through webinars, seminars, and obviously couples therapy. We do it conjointly. Um, I'm, I live in Israel. My dad's American. My mom's Israeli. And my whole life, I've been back and forth. So, you know, being uh, living in different places around the world, nothing feels like home and everything <laughs> feels like home. So that's the, the plus and the minus. I would say one more thing is that I consider myself a multi-potentialite in that sense that I, I, I don't have one specialty. It's, 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 uh, I have a range of passions and I have to do all of them. In my case, therapy, art, and education, or else I just shrivel up and die. And I am super excited to be here um, and, and kind of talk with all of you men and women who are listening, kind of bring some healing to the world. Yeah. Well, and, and thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the, how I found you was a, a blog post, an article uh, post on, I think it was psychology today. And uh, I may butcher the title, forgive me. I'm, I'm sure you know it better than I do, but it essentially was uh, men, why are men afraid of their emotions? Is that, accurate why are so many why do so many men struggle with their emotion now what's interesting the original title was why do i struggle with it because the, the, the original article was about my journey and it was a bit too raw for psychology today so they asked me to make it more uh, about men oh, okay. uh, i'm happy to talk about my own struggles because um, i think it's super relevant yeah um, sure so well let's dive in why why do men struggle with uh with emotions whoa okay all right we're diving in so yes. This, this, there's a con. So I'm rewinding back four years ago. I hit 40. I handed my PhD after six years. I'm ready to, to you know, conquer the world. And then, and then, and then it hits me. What hits me? This depression, this lull, this lack of motivation. And I'm thinking, what's ha- what's happening? You know, just last month I was ready to, you know, write a book and tour the world. And now I can't, you know, I can't do anything. And it kind of set me, it freaked me out. And I think what happened to me personally was I, I uh, I went back to my bookcase as a therapist and there was a book that I was there for months and months and never picked it up. It's called, I don't want to talk about it. Mm. That's the name of the book by Terry real. Um, the sub the subtitle is, um, the secret legacy of the covert male depression. Mm. And Terrence real, I highly recommend that book. In fact, almost every man I work with sooner or later, will read that book as part of his journey with me. But the basic premise is this us men were born Um, Like all babies, we have a full emotional range. We can feel pain, we can feel love, we can feel joy. But then through psychological patriarchy, which is basically separating the masculine and feminine and positioning the masculine over the feminine and then then making all of that covert, what happens is we get socialized as boys as don't be a wimp, don't cry when you cry, baby. So we slowly have to let go of the loss of the relational. We have to let go of our feelings and we also have to let go of our relationship with our mom and with girls. And we have to be macho and strong. And then basically what happens, we toughen up, we kind of reduce our emotional range and we start running. The metaphor he gives is that there's a fire behind us and we're just running. Mm-hmm. Where do we run to? Work, women, porn, money, mm-hmm. drugs, food. So basically we're numbing ourselves out. So if we'd say that depression is over, overdiagnosed for women and underdiagnosed for men, but the covert male depression, contrary to the female depression, is expressed by numbness emotional numbness. Hmm. So if the emotional range is between one and 10, let's say, so one is deep, deep despair and 10 is big, big joy. Most of the men, including me, we're somewhere in the four to six, right? Not too hot, not too cold. I call that surviving. We're in survival mode, right? The advantages of having a a limited emotional range is I don't fall. I don't collapse under pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these men are listening. We're we're going through divorce, whatever. Like we have to survive. But the tax we pay is that we don't feel. We lose feeling because the key to our joy is in our pain. And if I'm not willing to feel the one to force, that deep despair, we will never feel the seven to tens of great joy. And then what happens is so these covertly depressed men, who, by the way, society, 
um, kind of enforces that by, oh, you're working so much, your output, like, why, why, why wasn't I feeling my depression? Because I was running on, you know, 120 miles an hour since I was 18, left my parents' home. I have been going, going, doing, 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 jumping through hoops, you know? And I think society says, oh, oh my God, he's, you know, he's doing amazing. He's doing so many things, but I actually never stopped to see what I want. Uh-huh. And what happened was I hit the 40, I hit the covert depression. I read that book twice, by the way, back to back. And then I realized, shit, that's what I'm having. That's what's happening to me. And Terry Real talks about, the only cure for covert male depression is overt male depression. We have to stop running. We have to let that shit hit us. We have to knock down. We have to fall down. We have to collapse. We have to realize, oh, shit, that's what's happening to us. So we can even start to get up. Now, what makes this even harder as a, as a couples therapist, couple family therapist, which means I'm a systemic therapist, which means I'm seeing these men. I'm seeing myself in, a, in relation not only to my wife and my kids, but also to my parents my friends, right? It's where system society has normalized that so much. So there's a psychological con. Am I talking too fast? Or is it? No, no, you're good. Okay. Cause I'm like, I'm passionate (laughs) about this. So there's a concept called normative male alexthemia. Alexthemia is your inability to know what you're feeling. Okay. And that's just a condition, a psychological condition. And and check this out. It's already normative male. Hmm. Like that's already a legit psychological diagnosis. Which basically means, and this is the real, I mean, the, the real disaster, the crisis of our times is not COVID. It's right. the fact that we see men as emotionally handicapped, as baboons. Right. Okay. And I see this all the time with couples, whether they're before divorce, going through a divorce afterwards, and men we have internalized our normal, normal, it's normal male alexthemia. Like it's normal that men will not be in touch with themselves will not know what they're feeling. And so many women that I meet will be like, my husband's an idiot. Um, he has no feelings. He's just a walking ATM. You know, just do me a favor, get out of the house, go to your buddies, go have sex, go have an affair, just leave me alone. Because our pain, because we have internalized that we have no feeling. Yeah. And then so many men will say, well, I, I don't need anything. I just want my wife and kids to be happy. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. We've been trained to say that. And then no wonder nobody takes our pain seriously. And a lot of these men, when are they going to wake up, Michael? They're going to wake up when it's too late. Uh, well, yeah, when when they're served divorce papers. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and what's wrong? I gave you money. I provided all these years. You know, right. I never cheated on you. I right. was a great father. You were, but you weren't. You you, you weren't feeling. You were numb. Yeah. And I think for a lot of us, I mean, I, and I, I want to say this as a systemic. Like when I work with clients, one of the biggest, I have a two pillar approach. One is play playfulness which is also lacking when you're in covert male depression, when you're numb, you yeah. become cynical, you become too cool for school. Yeah. Eh, eh, eh. Yeah. And then you're just like, you're, I call them a four to sixer. You're a four to sixer. Yeah. And four to sixers are seen as one dimensional. You're not interesting. I'm not curious about you. Yeah. Cause you're like, eh, you know, it doesn't really matter. You're like a cactus kind of stuck. Yeah. Um, you never I- shoot you. Yeah. There, there's man, there's so much to this. And of course, when I'm doing it, uh, when I'm doing these things, I think about my, my mindset and what I've gone through. And, um, but one, one of the things that popped up in my head just now is wh- where does anger, uh, play in all of this? Because, uh, that's one thing we can express. And it seems to be one thing that we lean on pretty heavily as men. How does that play into this equation? Okay. That's a perfect question. So we get castrated, right? So we can we get circum, some of us get circumcised on our penis and then some, all of us get circumcised on our hearts. And what are we left with? Here's the kick. We get sex and we get anger. Yeah. Because they're the only two domains that are socially acceptable. Right. Now, why do men want sex so much? A, because we like having sex. Or B, because that's where we can feel. Yeah. I can grunt. I can yell. Like it's a, yeah, I can be <laughs> happy. I can express joy. I can finally still step out of that cage of the four to six. Yeah. And anger is easy for me to feel because I can't cry because I don't want to be a wimp. Yeah. I can't say I'm, I'm wounded, I'm jealous, I'm hurt, I'm lonely, but I can certainly be angry. When I get angry, I get what we call negative attention. I will get attention, but it's going to be negative. Yeah. And I want to say something about attention because this is interesting. We're all drug addicts of attention, all of us. Yeah. Our kids are drug addicts. We're, all we want is attention. So in parental guidance, we have there's this concept between positive attention and negative attention. Positive attention is a compliment, a hug. A good word, okay? Yeah. If my kid, if my eldest, my 10-year-old can't get that, he's going to go for negative attention, which is yelling at him, giving him a punishment, scolding him. That's still energy he's getting. Yeah. So for a lot of these kids, a lot of us boys, we believe that the only attention we're going to get is when we're angry, which is negative attention. Yeah. 
And slowly, that's the only tension we're gonna, we're gonna get. So we express anger, then so, so this it's a spiral, right? I'm expressing anger because that's what I have. So I'm seen as a baboon, as an aggressive, violent, aggressive man. My wife becomes a martyr. Yeah. And then I try to tell her something. She's like, stop yelling, stop yelling, stop yelling. Right. Okay, but we need to realize that it's on both. Both. Wait. We said play is one thing and owning your shit is the other one. Owning your shadow. We all have a shadow. Yeah. And for men, our shadow is not our aggression. It's not our aggression. Our shadow is our vulnerability. Yeah. Is our loneliness. Is our fear of expressing what we want. That is the real shadow of most of the men I work with. Yeah, this shit just hits me so hard. Uh, And it just makes me think a billion different things. But for whatever reason, what's hit me right now is uh, uh, what do we do as as, now as a parent, I have daughters, so I don't have this issue. at least directly, <laughs> obviously indirectly, um, as my daughters will experience uh, some of this shit as they uh, grow older and stuff. But as as a parent of a father, uh, or uh, as a father of a, of a son, what what do you do? Uh, what what? How do you change this? Wait, wait. First, let's ruin your fantasy about. Let's rewind to you and your daughters, okay? Let's 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 add some. Let's add another layer of guilt over there on your shoulders, okay? <laughs> yeah. As when, if I when... need more. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is what I tell men every single day in the clinic. There's no problem. You want to be a four to six, by the way, next to every four to six emotionally covert, covertly depressed man, there's a bitter, um, (laughs) married, bitter, married, single mom Mm. who's knocking on his chest saying, open up, open up, open up. It doesn't really want to hear his pain. Okay. But get this. Okay. So our daughters are looking up and like, oh, that's what a man is. Oh, a man's a four to six covertly depressed, you know, porn watching, emotionally numb, cynical thick skin man oh i'm gonna marry someone like that or i'm gonna rebel rebel against my dad and marry someone like that mm. so the, the onus is on us men if we want to if we want to raise a generation of women that don't see men as one-dimensional baboons we have to be modeling something else sure. now that's just about girls now about boys and i, I want to share a personal story so you know my wife's a phd in gender and we're very gender aware and i read the book and and I remember seeing my son from kindergarten, you know, like, so in kindergarten, wearing dresses, you know, expressing himself, putting makeup. He enters first grade. Within a month, everything stops. He only plays uh, soccer. Okay, mm-hmm. only plays soccer. No more girls. Doesn't laugh anymore. Doesn't dance. Doesn't doesn't get dressed. It happened within a month, and it's it's kind of crazy to see psychological patriarchy slowly slicing away my son's emotional range. And every time my son cries, I, I, I cherish those moments because at least he still has access to that. I cannot tell you the amount of men who haven't cried in like 30 years. Jesus Christ. And I think, I think that's, and I think for a lot of men, the, the problem with this is that it's, it's the real pandemic. So when these guys go out to have a beer with their friends, they're all saying the same stories. Uh-huh. That's, that's the norm. And, and what I'm trying to do here is, re, is to revolutionize, but it's hard because when I talk yeah. to these clients, they're like, they're like, but my best friend has the same situation. You know, we only drink beer and talk about girls or football or. Yeah, yeah. And I and I think, I, I mean, maybe I know you want to jump to how we solve it, but the first realization is to realize that we have that. And men obviously want to solve. Oh, I got it. So what do I do? No, no, for, <laughs> right. no, no, no. Let that shit land. Let it land in your body. Realize that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think it's something that I, I talk about pretty frequently um, because I think the way that we are doing these, uh, the way the way that we are handle ourselves emotionally, uh, in particular, um, when we have these crises like divorce, I think what it does to a lot of men is it leads to suicide because they don't know what the fuck to do with all of this pain. They have no idea yes. where yes. to put it. Yes, um, yes, it's yes. so foreign. It's not, you know, in either the so I, you know, there's. I don't like to generalize because I think that's being fucking lazy, but, but there are some generalities that, that occur, right? You, you got, you get a guy who gets very, very fucking angry, hates all women. You get a guy who only wants to fuck all women. And then you get a guy who uh, is super sad and depressed and, and, and lonely and all these things. And then a guy who kills himself. It seems like those are the, those are the things um, that, that are, are outcomes of this, of this particular crisis. So I, I'm all, I'm with you. I'm, I, I believe that, um, we are really, really fucking bad at, at dealing with our emotions. Uh, it's and it's, yeah, I, I don't know that I looked at it like, at, uh, in, in comparison to COVID, but, um, it's a pretty fucking good comparison, honestly. I, I mean, I mean, I mean, if you think about it, okay. It, like, because also look at the media and the movies we watch, you know, it's the Marlboro man. 
Right. Right. That's who you're watching. You're watching Tom Cruise fighting, you know, he feels nothing, you know, yeah. 007. Right. So like yeah. we have a big crisis and, and just like women are facing a crisis of now be a career woman and also be a mom. Right. And now with this new expectation of a man, I want you to breastfeed your son, but also keep making the money. Right. And when I told my wife, I want to go and do my PhD in improv and therapy, she was like, great, but I don't want to. I don't want to drop in the level of income. I don't want to lower my. So she was basically saying, "You keep, you keep providing, and then do whatever you want on the side." Right. All right. Because if I said to her, "I want to quit my job and kind of do it, dedicate myself to my art," she'll be like, "No, no, no." Right. So a lot yeah. of what's happening now it's also because that's the way men are seeing. And I'll just let's do a quick. I want to do a quick game with you. Ready? Sure. Michael. All right. Ready? I'm gonna imagine we had a couple of shots, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna say a sentence. I want you to complete it intuitively with the first word that comes to your mind. Okay. Ready? Ready? Men are? Oh, man. Uh, angry. <laughs> okay. Ready? Ready? Women are? Whores. <laughs> That's terrible. Did I say that shit out okay. loud? Right, 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 right. What, last one. Children are? Uh, I, I would say happy, but I don't. Yeah, that's what came to mind first. I don't know. Okay. So I do this with almost every couple I have, and I have a whiteboard here in my clinic. And about five times a week, what I will see next to the word men from both genders, by the way, mm. will be men are assholes, men are horny, men are mm. disgusting, men are aggressive. Yeah. When I did this with, I'm in, I'm in family therapy with my parents. My mom is 76. When I did this with her, she was like, men are pigs. Mm. Okay. So I said to her, I asked why, why, why did you think that? And she refused to tell me, I'm assuming because she was assaulted as a girl, I'm assuming, but she never told me. Right. And why am I saying this to you? Because like, Men are angry, right? So you yeah. that's called a core belief. A core belief is something that you cannot disprove. It's like the world is a beautiful place or the world is a dangerous place. It doesn't right. really matter. What's your core belief? Right. You know, for he who holds a hammer, the whole world is a nail. Yeah. That's a core belief, right? Sure. So if I think, if you think that men are angry, okay, if I thought for many years, I'm, just, I'm trying to clean up, mine was men are bad. Because mm. that's what I inherited, right? Men are bad, but I'm a man. So then I have this cognitive dissonance. Wait, am I a bad person? Mm. Now, here's the problem, right? So next to that covertly depressed man, there's the bitter martyr, the married single mom. So she's implicitly, so the kids are getting from the mom, oh, that's a man. Oh, men are emotionally retarded. They're, they're you know, on the second date, my, I have to share this story, and I hope my wife will be on this podcast so you can get the other version of that. On the second <laughs> date, to. so Galit said to me, half-jokingly, fathers are overrated. Now it was a real, it was a, it was a cute joke, but she grew up with a twice divorced mom that even when she got remarried, she was still a single mom. Right? right. And I think what I'm trying to say with that, like we've inherited that. So when I did this game with my kids, I said, boys are like sock is 10, Lila is seven. Right. Mm. So they both said, um, boys are great and girls are great. But then my son said to me, but why do you and mommy think that boys are not good? Huh? So he implicitly is feeling that we some we ha, we inherited core beliefs that boys are bad, and look and Mike with all the work we both have done, we still have negative association with men. We're yeah. and we're men, yeah. and we're men, and like yeah. if this is the way we're perceiving men. And when you're talking to your daughters implicitly, that message is channeling down, it's funneling down, yeah. and there's this shame, and there's this we're we're holding on this shame. It's getting even worse with the Me Too era, right? Because every man is potentially an aggressor. And there's a pro we're, we're in a real crisis. And I think I suddenly thought about that book, uh, Iron John, right? Mm. Iron John is one of the core books of the new wave of, of masculinity. And he basically talks about Robert Ply, who's a poet, American poet and kind of healer, if you want a therapist. He said, the biggest crisis that we have, no initiation. There are no elders. Mm. We don't have positive role models of people that were like men that were, you know, we say Yiddish menches, that were just good people. Right. Yeah. we're missing that and like i'm just thinking about me and you like you said men are angry i think men are bad like yeah. it's that that's a pandemic that yeah. that is that that will create i mean your daughters are already like if i would ask your daughters i mean here's a, here's a good whole, whoever's watching this go ask your sons and daughters have them complete the sentence boys are girls are yeah. and just see what they say and that's going to give you a really quick indication of where we are right now yeah Oh, well, it, in, I, I agree that we obviously need to embrace the fact that this is true, right? But we also need to do something about it. So what the fuck are we exactly. doing about it? <laughs> <laughs> so easier said than done, but I think, of course. I, I think but, but so I just, I, so for me, I think this is what I say to men. So the first thing that men need to learn, they need to learn how to feel. Mm. Now, here's the, here's the paradox. They don't actually know, they, they don't need to learn how to feel. They need to learn how to 
validate what they're feeling and just starting to recognize that, name that. Because emotional intelligence, a lot of it is learned. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh yeah. Just like just like Eskimos have forty words for snow. Like men, we have a very limited emotional vocabulary because no one ever shared with us. No one ever said, "Are you feeling jealous or are you right. kind of sad?" Like so. So the first thing is learn how to to learn relational skills. How do you learn that? You either go into therapy, you start doing workshops, join a men's group. I highly recommend. Um, I think what's happening now in Israel and also in the states is kind of this new wave of these men's group where it's around a bonfire, but it's less about group. Right. It's more about sharing feelings and not getting advice. Because for a lot of us, you know, this we men we, we grew up with reports talk. Report talk means when when boys communicate, there's all, it's always around a problem, and then it needs to be solved. Right. Right. So male intimacy, if you look at it, oftentimes is silent. We'll be fishing together. We'll watch a football game together. Whereas girls' communication is called rapport talk. They will communicate on the problems without solving them necessarily. I had this. Oh my God, I also had this. No. Okay. So they connect through the problems, but for boys, we don't teach them how to distinguish what they're feeling. So first of all, you need to learn how to express your feelings to widen your emotional range. And for that, you're going to have to be able to finally feel the pain. Mm. And if I go back to what you said, either kill yourself, drink yourself to death, right. have sex with every woman you met, yeah. or just completely numb yourself down. No, all four of those solutions are not. No. And for a lot of men that I work with, I tell them you're going down the rabbit hole going to hurt as hell but that's the only chance you have to really feel joy and if you don't widen your range your kids like a lot of times they'll ask men uh, i won't ask you too much because i don't do a therapy session here live (laughs) but for a lot of us wouldn't be the first time it'd be fine no like so i'm just saying like what what would be your emotional range mike what would you what would you say from one to ten i mean i i feel like it's pretty good but but i don't know i would say i'm a i'm an eight and what's the low, what's your range? Like what, what, what would be your range in terms of like what the emotions how are? How low do you usually, no, like how low, like if I, if I'd film you for a week, what emotional range would I see you from eight to what, how low would you go? Oh, how low range? do I go? Um, you know, I'm not talking about extreme moments. Yeah. I, you know, uh, probably a four. I've been, I've been feeling pretty fucking good lately uh, in the last couple of months. So I don't feel like I've had very many lows. Uh, my birthday was a bit of a low. That was, uh, that was two months ago, almost two months ago. Um, but I, I, I've been doing pretty fucking well. I'm, I'm not, this is not a foreign concept to me to embrace my emotions. Good. Well, you've also, you're also a man that's done a lot of work and you're hosting. I mean, part yes. of this whole podcast is your way of healing yourself and 100%. your dad, if you, what, what was the, what was your emotional, what was the emotional range of the dad, of your dad, when you saw him wait, when you were about eight, nine, like when you were a child, not now. Well, he's passed on, on uh, unfortunately, uh, a long time ago. Um, when I was eight or nine, my dad would have been like almost he was twenty eight or so, um, and he would get pretty low, and he would shut down, and he would get. Yeah, I didn't. My dad wasn't, wasn't ever really happy, like overtly. Right. You know, like in, you so know. he was like a like a two to five kind of thing. Two to five. Yeah. Five means like neutral, right? Yeah. So that's what you saw. That's what you yeah. basically saw. So a lot of us are like, I don't want to be like that, right? Mm-mm. Right. But at the end of the day, we end up replicating a lot of what we saw. That's called an intergenerational script. Mm. So in my case, my dad, my grandfather was an Italian immigrant to, to New York. He had a restaurant. So my dad grew up with a father that was asleep on the sofa every night at night. Mm. So he basically saw his father was like a five. He never saw him laugh. He never saw him cry. He was mm. just a work machine trying to provide for his family. My dad was a four to six. The only time I saw him really happy was when he was singing barbershop. He formed the first Israeli barbershop in the Middle East. So on stage, he he could reach the eights, even the nines, right? Hmm. And he was visceral and he was alive and he was funny and he was hungry and he was passionate. And then he'd get off stage and he'd go right back to the four to six. Hmm. And I think for me, I didn't know, you know, if I wasn't a therapist, it's clear to me that I'd be a four to sixer. Hmm. In fact, I have a brother who works in computers and in my view, at least, he's, he's much more close to the four to six. So I think for a lot of us, we have to realize that our role, we have no role models. No, oh yeah. and, I think what's, and, and I think what's interesting is when, when a man is too emotional all right, or expressive, he obviously gets labeled as gay. And I think that there's a problem there, the homophobic fear. Mm-hmm. But actually what's happened is there are models out there of emotionally men, straight, emotional men that feel feelings and feel and like, Another question here, complete the sentence. Okay, ready? Here's another one for you. Ready? Feelings are? 
uh, complex is what hits me. Right. <laughs> and if I, and if we'd rewind, if, if we'd rewind four years ago before you're divorced, uh, I would say said feelings are bad, negative, something, something not exactly. good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Feelings are useless. Yes. Feelings are, Oh my God, I have one on my board. because I, I just did therapy a couple. Of, so the guy said feelings is a waste of time. Mm, well, that's, that's an accurate thing. I think that, uh, men, right. men, yeah, I think I could, I could, yeah, I hear that. <laughs> right. So, so, so he literally, and this is from yesterday, right? He wrote, wait, things are a waste of time. So of course it's going to be four to six. Now, now if you're four to six, or then you attract your life, right? Somebody who likes you is a four to six, but it's going to complain all the time about you. Yeah. And then basically, of course, you're not going to be feeling because it's a waste of time. Yeah. Can, can we go, can we go yeah, over sorry. the scale? Can we go over the scale? Cause I'm, 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 <laughs> what's like what's one and what's 10 like where I, i'm okay I kind of so, got lost so I'm, there. I, okay so one is the deepest darkest feel, despair okay like deep deep pain like depression ah, yeah depression. depression oh right yeah and then 10 is ecstasy is elation is wow okay and very rarely will you see men at those extremes on the day-to-day you yeah. might see them when they finish a marathon or when they divorce. Okay. But yeah. on the day to day, a lot of us are four to six years, but here's, here's where it gets a bit more complicated. Okay. Why the key to your joy is in your pain. Mm. Okay. If you want to feel more joy in life, you're going to have to open up and feel the, the, the low feelings. Yeah. Why? Because in fact, it's not a line. It's a circle. Mm. One in 10 meet. It's like those moments when you don't know if you're laughing or crying or doing both. Yeah. You've had those moments, right? Those those yeah. peak experience moments, right? You're like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> that is li- that's a lie. That's vitality. Yeah. And so, so many men were were dead man walking. We're dead yeah. man walking. Literally, it's not, it doesn't say dead woman walking. It right. says dead man walking. Yeah, true. Yeah. So for the guys that are starting this journey of divorce, they are definitely in the depths of despair. Um, and and this is sort of the partially what I would ask at the end. So I'm going to try and steer it a little bit differently, but to them, they don't, they're not, um, of course, when you're a a two or one, whatever you're, you're, you're not, uh, seeing anything, but, but that moment and that space and that time, but like, how do you, um, how do you get men out of that space? How do you, especially in the beginning of this process, it's really fucking hard and it engulfs your entire life and it destroys your identity. There's so many things going on here, but, but you are definitely right. pretty low. How do you, how do you get out of that? How do you, what does it take? Does it take seeing some hope? I think so. Does it take venting and talking about it? What, how do you get out of that one or a two or whatever the low is for you? Well, here's the advantage of actually of most of our listeners, right? Cause when I meet men, not when they're on the brink of divorce. So for them, they have no reason to change. They have no motivation. So they have a bitter wife who doesn't put out. Their kids don't see them as a walking ATM, but they're, they're thinking that's normal, okay? So yeah. at least if you're listening to this podcast, there's a high probability you've gotten that slap in the face. Life has yeah. hit you in the face. Yes. Like you've hit that first over depression, whether you, want, you knew it was coming or not. So that's good news. So at least you're waking up. Now, the question is, do you want to live? Hmm. And by I mean live is feeling the, the whole emotional range. Because the first thing you're going to have to do is accept that pain is an inevitable part of being human and feelings are not useless and feelings are not bad, but feelings is what distinguishes that and makes us human. And that is a deep relearning. The difference between me and this table is that I can feel shit. Okay. You want to be human? Start feeling. That is the thing. And in fact, I even tattooed on my arm, feel. Oh, nice. It's that bad. Like I had to really tattoo that to my arm to remind myself to feel because my default is to go numb. Yeah. My default is to go numb. Okay. So for these men's, and men and women listening or partners of these men, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. The first thing is to realize, oh my God, I'm feeling these feelings. I need to find a way to talk it out. I need someone to recognize that. It can be with a friend. It can be with a therapist. It can be joining a men's group, which I highly recommend as well. Um, because for some men going to therapy, because if I do this therapy is complete the sentence, right. Michael, four years ago, therapy is, what would you say? Well, yeah, I, you know, I, I've, I've had an okay relationship with therapy because my, my father passed away, uh, uh, when I was 20. So I don't have that bad of you, but I would have said, it, uh, before any of that kind of stuff, but you know, yeah. Waste of time. Exactly. Gay people or whatever. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah so, for sure. So we first, so that's why I think men, men's group can be a very interesting place for these people that are therapy avoidance yeah. averse, you know? And I think, uh, I, I don't, uh, so the thing is, how, first realize you are feeling pain. You're probably hitting 
your first wake-up call for yeah. over depression. Yeah. And then instead of running away from that feeling, trying to not feel it by drugs, women, killing yourself, whatever, right, right. is to kind of go into that feeling and have someone hold your hand and realize this will pass. Yeah. This too shall pass. Feelings are, by the way, they're a wave. If I can breathe yes. long enough, they will pass. This period will pass. Yeah. You will not always feel this way. Now, everybody knows it here, but when you're actually going through the trenches, oh, yeah. you don't remember that. But that's why, just like in AA, you need someone to be there next to you. Yeah. You need someone that can see you on one hand, that can love you and heal you, and but also help you keep breathing and keep, keep, keep going in movement. Yeah. And I think for a lot of men, this is really relearning. Yeah. So once you kind of meet your own pain, so Terry Real talks, you know, his examples in the book are very like CEOs that lost everything, you know. Right. I think a lot of us, we feel this, even if it's not that dramatic. I mean, divorce is dramatic and traumatic. Yeah. But um, the, the, the idea is for a lot of men, if they go through the journey, they rediscover life. So part of it is also going back because you remember the metaphor with running away from the fire? Yeah. It's also running away from my pain and my father's pain and my mom's pain. So part of it is to stop, and this is the, the metaphor that Terry Real gives, you turn around and you face the fire and let the fire hit you, yeah. which means opening up all the shit that you've boxed up for years. Now, for a lot of men, they're like, but I don't want to be a crybaby. It's not crybaby. It's realizing what you, had, what you didn't get. And here's one more concept that I want to say for a lot of these men. So Terry Real talks, so there's active abuse. You know, when I get hit by my parent, I get humiliated, you know, when they're when they're abusive to me but he has this other concept that when i read it it resonated with me it's, he calls it passive abuse passive abuse is when kid children it's called them boys right now because we're focusing more on men they don't get what they need as children they're not seen they're not celebrated they're not touched they're not hugged they're not allowed to verbalize their feelings they're not taught emotional literacy right that is passive abuse and when i share this with these men like when i read it, i was like what but I was functioning, you know, my parents were yeah. okay. But then I realized, you know, my mom was depressed for many, many years and there was no one to talk to. So the second I say this to these men, like you suffer from passive abuse. So they're like, no, I'm not. Right. But if you can accept that, not in the way to feel pity for ourselves, but realize, yes, something was lacking. We did not get the tools. So we need to teach ourselves. But for that, we need to stop and let that stuff hit us. And not to be afraid to talk about what happened in my childhood, not to be afraid about talk about the models I saw at home, to talk about the secrets that nobody talked about, to talk about the shame, to talk about the fact that I always have to be happy. Like I was a pleaser mm. and everybody was happy that I was a pleaser. Yeah. And for many years, I was stuck with that pleasing. I was like, I was the good kid because my brother was like the, the challenging one. I was the sweet one. Yeah. And it took me many years to realize like this has locked me in a four to six of a facade as if I'm connected, but I'm not. And for a lot of us, it's scary because it's, re it's releasing these business cards you've been holding on for a long time. And I want to say one more thing about this process because I want, to, I, want to, I want to give a real warning because if you drop your business card, you might lose some relationships. Mm -hmm. People are going to be like, hey, what's up, man? That's not the Michael I know. Yeah. Okay, so don't you, you might be disappointed but because you're unbalancing the system, but that's the only way to attract to your life people that can deal and want the, the fuller you. Because Estelle Perel says the sentence, which I think is really relevant for divorce, divorcing men or divorced men, ready? We will all be married more than once. The question will be with the same partner. Hmm. We will all be married more than once in our lifetime. The question is, will, will it be with the same partner and why? Because we all change. Yeah. We're constantly changing. Every seven years, every cell in our body is different. Now, here's the thing. A lot of us grew up with parents that had one marriage for 20, 30, 40 years, or they divorced. We never saw, we never saw our parents redefine their relationship, renegotiate their relationship. Yeah. And for a lot of these men, I'm saying, if you don't do the work, you're going to replicate this in your next marriage. Yeah. So use this time, use this crisis to collapse, start widening your emotional range by first letting the pain fill you up. You will not die from it. You will breathe through it. It's a wave. Yeah. Teach yourself how to recognize these feelings. I want to do a shout out to... Um, to another book by Mark Brackett, Permission to Feel. Mm. He built a whole model of how to recognize your feeling. And there's a free app you can download and you and actually said, Mark, what you are feeling. It's like, a, now it sounds ridiculous. I've been doing this for a couple of months, but it's so interesting because I don't even know what I'm feeling. Mm. So he like, he teaches you and you learn to recognize your feeling. And then from there, the next phase after, so first recognize that you're, you're hitting the over depression, let that pain, 
run through your body, teach yourself relational skills. After you go that, the next step is uh, joy is a verb. You're going to have to practice joy. Because for a lot of us, joy, uh, you know, let's play this game again. Michael, joy is? Foreign. Exactly. So when I ask my parents, if you're, if anyone, any listeners, if your parents are still alive, go ask them these questions. So when I said, um, you know, mom and pop, joy is, so my mom says joy is dangerous. Hmm. Right, because as a depressed person, if you're if you're happy, that means you're probably in a manic episode, right? right? And my dad said joy is I don't believe that such a thing as joy. You know, right. like I grew up in a house where joy was seen as like it's scary, it's dangerous, it's showy off. You want to show? You're going to show off that you're happy, right? Right. So how am I going to feel? So of course I'm going to be a four to sixer. Yeah. And that's the core. If that's the belief, the, the messages I'm getting about eight, nine, ten. Yeah. So you have to teach yourself how to feel joy. How do you do that? You joy is a verb. Yeah. And all, by the way, all these nuggets, you can also say in the YouTube or in that and the blog and the psychology today blog. But what I want to say yeah. is like, after you learn to feel the pain and after you practice joy, the next thing is it's time to get back into relationships. You need to practice these skills. Now it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship or sexual relationship, but this needs to be practiced. It cannot just be in therapy like that. That's why a men's group I like, because it's also social skills, but like you need to learn how to do this in an intimate relationship, how to say I was hurt by, you know, you joked about my gut. Right. But I have a man bod, but the truth is it hurt my feeling. Yeah. I'm like, please don't do that again. That seems so um, opposite of what men do, right? Right. Because when I get hurt, I bottle up or I yell back. Well, it's a fight or flight. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. So yeah. There, there's a couple of right. things I want to touch on. Um uh, anger for sure. And, and, and diving into to new relationships, uh, too quick, but, but, but first you mentioned it, uh, very briefly in passing, you talked about letting the pain run through your body. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Cause, cause it's something yeah. I, I talk about all the time. You got to get into your body in order to process it and get it out get out of flight, flight, freeze or fawn, depending on how many of those fucking things you want to talk about. Um, right. you have to get into your body. Can you talk about that? So a lot of us, because there are, because our brain is our bodyguard. So whatever our brain says is dangerous for us, it won't let it, won't let it in. Yep. So first we have to tell our brain um, pain, uh, complete the sentence, Michael. Pain is. I was going to say love, but I think, isn't that like a song or something? <laughs> <laughs> so for a lot of us men, we don't want to feel pain. We like, no, we have no yeah. pain, no gain, right? Yes. But we have to realize that pain, you know, I, I think about the Imagine Dragon song, right? Pain, you made me a believer, right? But the mm-hmm. idea is you realize that what I'm going through, this is part of life. And I'm probably feeling the one to fours right now. And to let that shit hit you and let it, let yourself collapse, which means you might have less output. You might be doing less hours at work. You might be working out less. You might be eating more. Like to, to realize I, I am, something hit me and I am, I'm like for a lot of these men, we don't want to stop it. We're going to keep going. No, stop. Let that shit hit you. Drop to your knees, cry in the fetal position like let it out yeah. you have to start crying like that is the release of energy for a lot of men it's so hard but you can't force yourself to cry but you can certainly and, and, and with men in the clinic i'll have them literally lie in the fetal position almost like to regress them back and just to hold them there and just like this might sound crazy but like for a lot of us that's what we really need we need someone to hold us especially when our wife left us and the kids are not with us and we feel so alone in the world and we feel like this little boy again we need someone to say it's okay you can cry and just like you do to your own, if like your if your daughter had a breakup or she had a fight with her best friend, that's exactly what you would do. You don't even think twice. You do that automatically. You are now that boy. And I'm reminding for a lot of us, we have a wounded child in us. Oh, but yeah. what's covering that is the adaptive child. The adaptive child is the is the part of us that that's surviving. Yeah. So we need to help that adaptive child calm down so the wounded child can come out, and you can say, yeah, it hurts so badly. And all the FOMO, what did I do? I could have done differently. Yeah. Yes, all of that. Don't suck it up. Don't pretend everything's okay. And don't run away from it. Yeah. And each one of us, and find an accountability partner. Again, it can be a therapist, a cousin, a best friend, a men's group. You can do this, but you need someone to hold you there because you will not be able to hold yourself. And you don't want to hold yourself because at the end of the day, here's, here's the thing, right? I grew up, my core belief is that if I fall, if you would have asked me and I was aware at 10 years old, I'd say, if I fall, no one's going to catch me. Yeah. Like I need to take care of myself. Like I had physically, I had everything I needed, but emotionally I was alone. Yeah. I call it the lone ranger, right? The lone rangers. We, we like, we'll meet someone. We'll, we'll kind of, we'll rest in this, in this, in this ranch with this woman, but the horse is still waiting for us. Yeah. 
one wrong move, I'm back on the horse alone. Yeah. And for a lot of these men, we, we want to learn how to be vulnerable. Dependency is not a bad word. That's another shadow of men. Like, I don't want to be dependent. Right. But if you're, but if you're never going to be dependent, you're never going to feel real love. You're never going to feel really at home. And, and like this, I'm learning from Galid because fortunately, I've never lost my, like, I wasn't close to my grandparents, but I've never experienced the loss of a parent. Mm. So, from, so she says to me, you don't know. I mean, you don't know how much you're so afraid of feeling that pain, but you need to realize it's, it's worth the love. Better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. So for a lot of these men, I want to say the message is, yeah, it hurts like hell, but we, but this is part of being alive. And I know you don't want to feel this, but this will pass. But you want to be in a relationship where you might feel this thing because every person you ever meet will one day die and leave you. Yeah. Sorry, that's existential loneliness. If you no, have to no, accept no. that, sorry, no. right? And like yeah. a, lot of, a lot of these men and women, I'll meet them and they're like, I'm retiring. I'm never going into another relationship again. I never want to feel this pain again. But then what message are we sending to our kid that you don't have to, that fathers are overrated or that mothers are overrated yeah. or the mothers are bitches? Yeah. Like we have to realize and, and we, we are relational creatures. Yeah. We're relational. Carl Whitaker was a family therapist. He said that if somebody's alone, he, he's, he's, he's handicapped in a sense because there's parts of you you will never discover. You'll only discover this in relationships. Yeah. And to not demonize women because the second we demonize women, especially if you have kids, we're, we're dropping that core belief down a generation. Yeah. And then we'll have, I mean, men here, women. So the woman said women are bitches. And the, the husband said women are blabbermouth. Mm. Okay. That's a core belief he inherited. Yeah. All right. That's that, that is, we are passing on this traumatic mindset, these traumatic core beliefs. Yeah. Am no, I answering your question, Michael? I'm all over the place. I, I think so. I honestly, I I'm, I'm just, uh, overwhelmed with all of this shit because there, there's so much to it. And, and I love these conversations. Um, so I, one of the things I definitely want to talk about, and you, you kind of mentioned it there a little bit, um, uh, is sort of, uh, avoiding relationships in this particular group. And I love all you guys, most of you guys, some of them, a lot of them, I don't know the percentage. They really just want to get into another relationship immediately, or at least go dating immediately. Um, as a PhD, cause I don't have one of those. Can you tell these fuckers to stop dating so quickly after their divorces, please, sir. And explain okay. why. Yeah. Okay. So we're going back to, we will all marry more than once. Oftentimes I'll meet people. I know this woman who married three times, but she essentially married the same man, just a different, his name was Bob and Jim. She had, she didn't do any work. If yeah. you don't do any work, you're going to replicate that. You're going to find yourself down the line with it's two months or two years in the same shit, the same dynamic. Why? Because you have not worked on your, you have not owned your shit. Yes. So I get the idea why you don't want to feel alone and you might be overwhelmed with how to do laundry or all the other stuff that some men have to deal with. But if you go in too fast and you will find yourself once again, seen as the jailer, the aggressive, the baboon, the emotional handicap, the child. Or whatever, whatever derogatory term you were seen is. Why? Because you can only attract to your life yes. people that like your business card. So yes. if you're a tough guy, four to six, emotionally handicapped person, yeah. you're going to walk around the bar or, or the dating app, and you're going to attract your life. Women are like, oh, I want that type of man. So I can feel superior to him and then belittle him for not feeling anything. I call it the, the intimacy queen. Next to every intimacy queen, there's emotionally handicapped. But it's systemic, right? Because yeah. that's her excuse to not feeling intimacy. Because next to you, she's the queen of intimacy. But she's also scared of it because we're all emotional virgins. We're all scared shitless of intimacy. We just attract to our lives people that will enable us not to feel intimacy. Jesus Christ. So you, I mean, that is a... <laughs> <laughs> that, that's going to be a clip. That's going to, I'm going to have to pull that one out. You just dropped some truth there. Jesus. Uh, that, yeah, I, yeah. I say it all the time. You, you attract what you are. And if you don't do any work, exactly. I, it's, it's like, uh, it's like we're sharing a mind sometimes here. But, but one, one more thing I want to say, right? So, so this is the thing about core beliefs. You can only attract your life people that have similar or complementary core beliefs. So if you think men are bad, you're going to attract your life to women that think men are bad. Hmm. Or men are need to be you need to be protective of women of men, of men right? right? And I think that's the thing. Like the only if you date too fast and you didn't change your business card, you only attract people that like that business card. Yeah. And you know, doing a weekend workshop, a Tony Robbins weekend workshop is not enough on working on who you are. Yeah. It's not a flash in the pan. It is a deep process of meeting your pain, and you have to stop running. Stop running. Feel that shit. Let it burn. Let it burn. All you guys, you've done tattoos, you've done piercings, you've done military service. You know what pain is, but this yeah. is a different type of pain. Yeah. 
I think I might love you, man. I really, I really. <laughs> I, love, I love you, man. <laughs> it's true. It's true. No, it is a hundred percent. It's, it's like. No one's talking about this. This is the yep. pandemic, Michael. We are in a deep crisis of masculinity yeah. and femininity, but like we're talking about men here today. Yeah, for, for, for sure. Uh, so, so uh, in, in that topic, masculinity, a lot of times I see in here, uh, anger. I see a lot of it. Right. Fuck all these bitches. I'm never dating again. They're all whores. Right. Um, shit, even right. I, I said it. <laughs> um, right. That was that, exactly. How, how, how do you, uh, how, how, how would you address those particular men who are just so fucking angry and, and um, just, they can't, that's all they, that's all they are. They're just anger. They're okay. just pissed. So, so let's, let's talk about this. So, so in classical therapy, anger is a secondary feeling that covers up um, yes. more vulnerable feelings like uh, loss, fear and so it's easier for me to feel anger anger is also an, a good response when i feel there's a threat but for a lot of men i'm going back, i'm rewind i'm reincorporating we spoke about the loss of the related the psychological castration that we go through as men yeah. so all i'm left with is sex and anger yeah. and when i'm angry that's when i a, get positive i get negative i get attention parentheses negative attention right they hear me roar I, at least at least i'm not invisible in this house yes okay and then i feel a sort of you know um Freud called this sublimation, socially acceptable ways of expressing aggression. But when I'm angry, okay, so so it's okay to be angry, right? Anger is who I am. But the problem is, if, if you're a one tr if you're a one trick pony, if it only comes out as anger, that is not an emotional range. Yeah. You're raging. Yeah. You're raging. You're not feeling. Yeah. And by the way, the opposite of conflict is violence. Like if I don't know how to deal with these inner conflicts, if I don't know how to deal with this, I will become violent. Yeah. So for a lot of these men, you, it's it's okay. You can be angry and fuck all the bitches and I hate the, 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 the but at a certain point, you're going to need help to go deeper beneath that. Because if you get stuck in the anger, you will become a bitter, cynical man. Yeah. And that's going to be a disaster. It's going to be a tragedy for your siblings, for your children, for yeah. the people around you. And you're going to attract your life, by the way, bitter, miserable people. And then you're going to wonder, why is my life so boring or routine or not interesting? Because you are in that mind state. And I think for a lot of men, so you have to find a way of expressing the anger, sublimate it, right? Hopefully through sports and less with drugs and food and porn. And then, but, but then keep going back to yourself. You need someone to block your exits. A lot of what I do in therapy is I block people's exit. What does that mean? I'm, I'm not letting you go to your default, whether it's fight, flight, fawn, freeze, yeah. go back to you and what's happening right now and what's happening right now. Somebody that's not going to be scared of you want somebody that can actually be kind of somebody you can bounce off. That's not scared of you. That doesn't pity you. Yeah. And that wants from you more, because here's another tragedy. Most of us don't have anyone in our lives that wants more from us. Everyone's okay with whatever dog food we throw around saying, how are you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay. No one's saying, no, 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 Michael, how are you? Or like, that's bullshit. You're actually upset. Yeah. We don't have that force in our life. Yeah. And we find somebody, even if you have to pay them that wants more for you, that's going to help you, Go beyond your exits and stay in the heat and, and force yourself to confront yourself because the only person you need to confront now is yourself. There will be a time where we'll, we'll, you'll go systemic and you'll see how your partner did you wrong and how both of you contributed to a shitty dance. That, that day will come and it should come and it will come. But until you confront yourself, there is no point going back to the dating scene because you're going to attract your life, women or men, I don't whatever your preference is, that right. like that business card. Yeah. The angry, volatile, you know, hyperactive man, the strong, silent type. Yes, right. you will attract another person that loves that. But what they love about it, it's gonna, it's called a flip flop. Yeah. What attracted me in the beginning is gonna drive me crazy two months later. So um, back to back to the uh, take a pause in dating. I, a year seems to be like the uh, normal recommendation uh is that what, what do you recommend uh and i know everyone's different and that's that's guys use that as an excuse to start dating after four months um <laughs> dude, oh everyone's different oh fuck's sakes um but what do, what do you recommend uh for, for a man who who just went through a divorce process how long should he stay single well staying single it's not about staying single or i think it's interesting because like i've never been asked that as a, as a time question i was more asked like how will i know i'm ready to go back now yeah, but you know, and I I agree that's a better way to look at it. But you know, guys, men, what, what they, they want a time frame, so that way they they can set the clock and go, okay, <laughs> it's been a year. Well, I'm well, out of here. Okay, okay. Oh, so what? Adds, I'm out of the jail, right? I'm out of the solitary yes, confinement. Exactly. Well, I, I think I think the question the, the question is, what do you do in that time? 
if you sit on your ass and watch Netflix and drink beer, a year is not going to be enough. Mm. If you immerse yourself in a process and you go into therapy or a men's group and you, and you kind of struggle with yourself in a couple of months, then you will start feeling it. You will know why, because you'll find yourself feeling more feelings. You'll find yourself crying in a Disney movie. Maybe yeah. you'll suddenly feel this moment of like dancing in your living room because you just saw your, your favorite song came on. Right. Like my, my tip for you would be um, to start trying to feel more. And I'd say one more tip. And, and, you know, when I, when I work with, with divorced men, I'll often ask them to start dating while they're still in therapy. So we could test out, hmm. test out their journey. So you'll notice who's, who are you attracting to these dates? And do you find yourself kind of replicating similar, sim like you don't want the complete opposite because the complete opposite is the same. Mm. It's just a mirror image, right? It's also the fantasy, but just notice how are the conversations going? Can I bring more? And, and here's my biggest tip for, for these men is that this is, it's also like an article and you'll see that like to own your shit, which basically means try to communicate at, because dating is a practicum, right? It's a stage. You're basically trying out the relational skills that hopefully you learned in therapy or in your men's group. Yeah. Cause you have to practice this. You can practice it with your kids, but it's a bit different because right. you're also their parents. Right. Yeah. And I tell clients, like, it's not enough to talk. You need to go practice these skills in a day. I need, I can't be the subject of this. I need to help you. I need to be more of your coach. And then what you want to be doing as you're dating, you want to put everything on, you know, you will put everything on the floor as fast as you can. Not, not like first date action, but like, hi, you know, I have a tendency to get really angry. It's hard for me to feel pain. Right. I'm a little bit embarrassed by my body. Yeah. And, and I think, why am I saying this to you? Because you want to attract your life. The next, we'll all be married more than once, right? You want to make sure that in round two, you don't have to be in the closet. Because a lot of us men, we're in the closet. Yeah. We don't even know we're in the closet, but our closet is emotionally, we're closeted. Yeah. We're four to sixers. Yeah. I have this man now, his wife hates his guts. And he's told me that sometimes, you know, he gets excited when, when, when he sees a, a masculine man. He gets excited. He was feeling embarrassed. He was feeling shame about that. For yeah. 40 years, he never told her that. Jesus. Because for his mind, that's, he's, he's, not, he's not gay. He doesn't want her to think he's gay. But like, so we're holding all these secrets. All these secrets slowly make us more and more 46ers because I can't talk about this. I can't talk about men. I can't talk about arousal. I can't get too excited. Yeah. So you want to be able to practice these skills and start sharing what is happening in you, especially your flaws. Yeah. Especially your flaws. Because if you really want to feel loved, you will have to show your shadow. Why? Because if I only show my best part to you, Michael, and then you say, I love you, I'm thinking, you have no idea who I am. If you only knew how crazy, fucked up, yes. perverted I am, you'd never love me. Yes. So, man, you need to come out early and say, and, and, and then you might feel, you might get rejected, which is also okay. Mm -hmm. But then you might finally feel how it is to be free because the point of being in a relationship, um, this is David Schnarch. He says, long-term committed relationship, let's call it marriage, is a people growing mechanism developed by humanity. You want to grow, you better go into a relationship. But the only way to be in a relationship is by owning your shit and bringing your shadow to the forefront. Because at the end of the day, and this is the working title of my book, Nobody Steal It, marriage is freedom. It's freedom. It's freedom to bring all the different parts of you. And for a lot of us, we felt jailed. We didn't even know we were jailed, right? In our first marriage, in your previous, the marriage is just December. And when I meet couples on a break, I'm saying, I, I hope I'm witnessing the slow death of your first marriage. I wish this to couples because every marriage needs to end because there's another, there's a new evolution, by the way. Right. And just so you know, the statistics is a year after the honeymoon, three years after the first kid and seven years. There's these cycles that we'll see in the clinic. Mm. Okay. We'll, we'll see it because these are, you're not the only, but a lot of us didn't realize that this is not the woman I married. Yes, it isn't. And it shouldn't be because she's not the same person. Yeah. Michael, when you were in your twenties, you were completely different now in your thirties. Like we are different humans. Our body's different. Our passion's different. Our mind is different. Our needs are different, but we're so scared. We're holding on to these, whatever business cards we had 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Yeah. So the biggest reframe I can offer you is yes, it was painful. It was shitty, but let's get, get you prepared for your next marriage where you'll feel, feel free where you can cry and you can laugh. You can be sexy. You can be ugly. You can be brave. You can be childish. That's what we're aiming for, but you will only find that partner if you allow yourself to be that. That's um, the only way you'll ever attract that woman or man into your life. I got to say, man, uh, you're you're really inspiring, man. I, uh, uh, someone commented they love your passion, and I I uh, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, 
Can, can you, um, I know we're, we're going about an hour here, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious, um, uh, success stories, um, both in terms of, and I'm not doing this to give hope to you gentlemen out there that have hope that you'll reconcile because it's not that kind of a question. It's more about the improvement of the man in that relationship. Have you seen, I'm sure that you have, but I, have you seen success stories where you, you, you had a, a marriage that was pretty well dissolved and you, it was, you were able to bring it back, but it was largely because of the work done. And I don't want to just say him, but that's what we're focusing on, but where the man really kind of changed um, how he dealt with his emotions and things. And, and he was able to, um, the, the marriage was able to be, to be uh, reconciled for lack of a better description. Okay. I don't know if you're going to like this answer, but here we go. Ready? My job as a couple therapist is not to keep couples together. My job is to help them get remarried. Raise the, what we call differentiation. Differentiation is my ability to be myself and to be in intimacy. Yep. That, is the, that is the muscle I'm working on. And for a lot of couples, I'll say, I don't know if you guys have another marriage. Hmm. But let's find out. Because life is short and you want to spend the next 30 years closeted. So are you willing to face your shit, own your shit, and grow? So what I can say, I don't know if this is whole for, so for a lot of, so I'll see a couple, they're on the brink of divorce. I'll say, okay, right now, this is your practicum to grow. This is your chance now to grow as a man in a relationship now. And you might as well do it with this partner because she's already here. Yeah. I don't know if she's going to be your next wife, but let's find out. Yeah. So I, I, I have seen now, what's interesting to say, like the fact that the, the husband is changed doesn't mean that the wife is going to do it. Right. But what I've noticed is, is a lot of couples, they'll, they'll, they'll divorce because they don't like the current marriage they're in. But they have no idea whether they had another evolution because they never actually worked on themselves. Yeah. They felt locked, trapped. Again, I, looked at, I look at generation up, my parents had one marriage their whole lives. So, oh, this is the marriage we have? I don't want this. So a lot of, it's hard for me to sell that there's another, you could have another marriage with the same wife. I'm in my third marriage with my first wife. Okay, because we went through a lot of shit and we, we, we are the power dynamics have shifted. And one of the reasons me and Gali work together, and I really hope you'll have her on the podcast, you can hear her version is like, because I want couples to see that you can do this, yeah. but do not. Do, and here's another caveat I want to say, you will not be able to do this journey if you're doing it for somebody else to save the marriage or to not fuck up your kids. It's not enough. It's not enough motivation. Okay, you you will have to do this because you want to feel free, because you want to feel loved, because you want to feel wanted and desired, because you want to feel appreciated. Yes. I cannot tell you the amount of women that say, I'll ask them, how curious are you about your husband from one to 10? 10 is you're fascinated, one is you don't care. They'll say three. You want to be in a relationship where someone's curious about you, where someone yeah. wants to kick your brain, yes. where they can't get enough of you. Yeah. But right now, if you're four to six, or you're not, you're not interested to yourself. Yeah. So yes, you can do this and you can go through all the pain and here's the good news or bad news. You might do all the work, but your wife still is holding on to the married single mom or to the martyr. Yeah. But then what's going to happen is, and I've, I've seen this, the divorce is not bitter. It's not angry. It's just like, it's, we're done. We want different things. And go back to friendships you had in high school, right? You had these friendships that kind of dissolved, not because of the fight, just because you grew, to, you, you, you grew apart. Yeah. Right, a, a, a sign of an angry, vicious divorce usually means that they're more focused on the other than themselves. Because when I point at you, Michael, three fingers are pointing back at me. But a lot of us don't want to do this; they just want to do this. Yeah. And and that's the first shift. So turn it around, look at yourself, and use this time with your partner in therapy, couple therapy, what is to start owning your shit. Be less busy about winning. And more about, okay, this is my practicum. I have another evolution here. I'm rebirthing or life is kicking me in the ass and saying it's time to, to evolve. Right. I don't know what your next evolution is, but I do know it's usually about widening your emotional range, widening. Right. And if you think about it, your kids, when they were born, boys or girls, they had the one to 10. Yeah. All babies yeah. are born one to 10. We, we, we narrow them down to four to six, especially our boys. Yeah. And I think if we can hold that in and start seeing, and I think what's happening to me with it, doing this work is it shifted from men are bad to men are hurt, yes. to men are sad, yeah. right? And I think if you can have a more compassionate view, and if you can reimagine masculinity in that way yeah. and, and find the, the support that we need, we can actually go through this hero's journey and find a new, wider way to live. Yeah. Um, and by the way, one, one last thing I want to say about this, 
you will notice if you're if you're in a relationship, okay, of whatever sorts, the more you'll widen your range, the more your partner can then mellow out and balance out. Because if you're a four to sixer, your partner's gonna go, ah, woo, they're gonna go crazy because they're just trying to knock on the door, open you up. Yeah. And then and the man will say, Well, my wife is so immature, she's so hysterical. No, she's not, she's balancing out your numbness. And you'll notice that if you can if she'll be more regulated when you'll be more wide, when you'll be more expressive. Um, guys, uh, I see some questions. Keep uh, start start bringing them now because uh, we're probably going to get. Yeah, yeah, questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll I can get... do this all day, Michael. I love this. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably get to those in a few minutes. Uh, I, I want to talk success stories again, but I want to talk about the man who is a four to sixer who now isn't, and and you can't count yourself. I want I want someone else that you uh, that you help to get out of uh, the sort of numbness that is men sometimes. So I'll go to a 50 year old man, religious, six kids. The kids were already older. He was in his late fifties. He came because he had a back operation. His wife was a couples therapist. Um, and basically the story he started with, he was completely, he was, he was watching porn. He never had sex with his wife anymore. She completely was full of contempt toward him. The kids didn't know him. He wasn't relevant. Like when they get, went shopping, he'd say, please get milk. They wouldn't get milk because he's, He's a walking ATM. And as we started working together, by the way, his wife would fall asleep. She would fall asleep. It, was, it would be Zoom call because it was COVID. I saw her falling asleep. She was so shut down from this man. She, she was so not interested. And she's a couple of therapists, okay? Yeah. Put that aside. Anyways, yeah. he starts, we start talking about the four to six. He starts watching these videos because a lot of, because knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And part of therapy is learning a new language. He started learning that and he started finally feeling the pain and the humiliation stop because a lot of what we'll do man we'll blind ourselves to our wives contempt of on us we blind ourselves we want to see that shit yeah. we find excuses why she's not having sex with her, why she doesn't want to touch us why she spends more time with her girlfriends on her phone than with us okay so he started opening his eyes seeing that seeing his wife falling asleep in couples therapy realizing she does not find him interesting at all letting that shit hit him and then he slowly started feeling more and he started verbalizing more to his wife. And then he had his meeting. He, he went up with his son and he, they had a man to man talk. He spoke about his feelings for his first time in his life. And I remember this moment where he said to me, I said, Al, I don't want to feel all this pain. I don't want to. He said, I want to stop. I don't want to feel. And I said, I said, you can stop. But if you stop, you're going back to being numb. You're going to go back to shutting it up. And then he started looking up to his parents and how he grew up. His parents already passed, but he started opening that shit up. And then he spoke to his sister, gleaning more information about his adaptive child. What happened to him? How did he close like that? And slowly what happened, he was feeling more. In the sessions, he became less cynical. He cried once. He could express to his wife openly his feelings, even if she was cynical about that. But then he'd call her on it and say, no, I'm serious. This really hurts me because, again, she'd mock him for, oh, are you sad now? Yes, I am. Hmm. And then slowly what happened, the bar rose and she had to let go of the throne of the intimacy queen. And her shadow came very apparent. But even though she's a therapist, she's also scared she listen to intimacy. Hmm. And suddenly they had a real spot, like they started meeting and it became more interesting. Now, I don't, I don't do like a happily ever after. They still had a lot more issues. Sure. And at a certain point, we also paused therapy because they were doing really well. But this is a man that thanks to a back injury, he, I, actually, I would have never met him. Like, mm. By the way, they're religious. They would have never divorced. Mm. But they, they would just have a parallel life. They'd be married singles, we call it. Yeah. Right? So that's an example of a man who's in his late 50s who made that journey. But that, that you have to understand that's like that's a lifelong journey of feeling because you can't once you start feeling it's hard to shut it off and you don't want to shut it up because that is life. Mm. And so for a lot of us, for a lot of these men, I want to go back again. If I'm sounding too pessimistic, let me know. I'll make it more optimistic. No, but good, man. my job is to help people see their shadows. Like yeah. half of the time, I'm just helping men stop blinding themselves and seeing what there is. And by just seeing that your wife is content, like has all this contempt to you, that's a great starting point to realize why, what's happening? What am I not bringing? Yeah. What am I not bringing to tell them there's more to feel? There's always more. Give me more, more, more to life, more to feeling, more to pain, more to joy, more to speak about, more to owning your shit. And you will discover and for a lot of these men, they get this rush. So this guy that gets excited in his penis when he sees a, a hot man, I told him, share this with your wife. And he's like, no, okay. But then he finds himself the following week. She says to him, 
you know, why don't you, like, and she's a martyr, right? So she's like, why don't you ever hug me? Why don't you ever nice to me? And then he turns around to her and he says for the first time in his life, because I was never held as a child and I was, I never experienced softness myself. Jesus. Okay. Now he didn't talk about the penis, but he did reveal something he's never shared. Yeah. So he came out, right? Yeah. Now she was shocked and obviously she didn't know what to do with it. But for him, that, that's being alive. And the next phase is, I, I told him, you need to start talking to your kids. Talk, talking to him about what happened at home, that his brother committed suicide, like tried to commit suicide, but that's a secret. That his mom was abusive. Like, you need to start speaking this and telling this narrative. You need to tell it yeah. to help them see a round man because they can feel your shit anyways. Yeah. So you might as well tell them one of the reasons that when we meet together as a family, no one's touching each other. You know, like, you need to tell, give them the backstory. Help your children see the backstory, the backstage. Because then after you share them that, or you share this with your partner, and they say that they love you, you will feel loved in a way you've never felt before. Because mm. then you won't pretend to be someone you're not. And I think, and I think that's what we want to be modeling. We want to be modeling men that are not afraid to say that they're afraid. To say, I don't, sometimes I'm embarrassed by my body, but I'm anyways going to go to the gym. I'm anyways going to go to the pool. Yeah. I'm, I, I think I'm a horrible dancer. I'm going to dance anyways because I think it's important because I love when you kids dance. All these things, like you can do this and you will find you more likely than not that the people in your life are happy to see the backstage. And the ones that are not, good thing. Good, find out now. So you don't waste your life with people that like you closeted. Fucking name. Life is short. Yeah, yeah. Life is short. And yes. I want to say one more thing. We spend most of our lives, we call it self-presentation, right? When can you really be you? At the end of work? After the kids go to sleep? After your partner falls asleep? Like, I want to be myself as much as I can in this life. I want, if you meet me, Michael, in the street, performing, in therapy, on this podcast, I want you to hopefully see the same asael. That's yeah. called integrity. Yeah. But for me, that's called freedom. I want to feel free to be myself. And I think that is a skill that's called differentiation. You can work on that muscle and you can generate a life like that. Because if you're in self-presentation and you only take off the mask at the end of the workday, or that, so you are basically false. And if you're false, you're attracting false people to your life. Because again, you can only attract people that have similar and complementary core beliefs. So if you're in self-presentation, you're going to be self-presentation. Yeah. And I think what's also happening in North America is this overly PC. Like there's so much PC now that as an Israeli with an American accent coming to the States or doing therapy with American couples, like the first thing I'll tell them is I'll say, guys, you will probably be insulted about what I'm saying, but I have to be blood because at the end of the day, I want to say one thing. We're all complex, complicated, multidimensional people. Yes. Yeah. But relationships have a truth to them. There's a simplicity to them. Yeah. Yes or no. How much are you attracted to this person from one to 10? Right. Women are, men are. Right. Like you need someone to keep it real with you. And you need to learn. I call this caveman consequences. I'm sorry. I'm just passionate about this. Okay. No, one dimensional okay. communication. Stop being vague. What caveman consequences? I don't like what's happening right here. What's a caveman consequence? When you are blunt and clear and one-dimensional, you are going to get much more heat. But there will be a vitality and a spontaneity there, right? Say it. Say, we call it. I call it. Say the thing. Right. Be direct. Whether it's good, I can say I love you. I can say I'm scared of losing you. I can say you're a fucking bitch right now. I can say I'm really, I'm really embarrassed by what you did to me. But as long as I can say it clearly and openly. Then I will be experiencing a type of freedom I've never felt before. And I will attract to my life. I'll either help my current partner evolve with me, or I'm going to attract to my life people that want this, that can deal with this, that can help me grow. I've grown more in the 11 years of Galif, my wife, than almost 20 years of therapy. Because uh, um, she keeps, yeah, sorry. No, no, it's interesting you brought up. I really legitimately wrote down, I don't know if you can see that, American versus Israel. Because I yeah. was super interested in what the difference is in men in particular between the two countries. Like, it sounds like you've done therapy in both. Is yeah, there a, now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're doing it in Israel, uh, for sure. That's where, you, that's where you live now. It, have you practiced therapy in the States? I'm assuming that you have. Yeah, I'm doing now on Zoom. Yeah. COVID has oh, changed the world. Oh, okay. Okay. So, right. so what is there a market difference between American men and Israeli men? Yeah. So, for again, right? I, no home, right? Yeah. As, yeah. So, so in both places, I don't feel at home. In Israel, I feel I'm in a, surrounded by, you know, barbaric, you know, I'm in a war zone. In the States, I feel it's all fake. And so so I'm, I'm critical on both nations and also obviously on myself, I am both. Yeah. I'd say that, so there's a, the big difference is like Israeli men, on one hand, we do the army 
and we're much more militant country. So the masculinity is in your face, yeah. much less aware. I mean, no recycling, no environmental consciousness, right. aggressive as well, very pa patriarchal, very sexist. Mm. So on one hand, men are more feel to say women are bitches. They'll say that, okay. Or like the guy said, they're, they're bitches, right? He'll say that next to his wife. <laughs> Whereas in the States, and, and that's one type of problem. Sure. And in, in, in the States, what I'll see is they're very smiley, mm. uh, <laughs> very passive aggressive, very, either they'll be super right. emotionally numb yeah. or they're super nice self presentation and yeah. keep gaslighting and belittling their partners because they cannot express what they're really feeling. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's only when you really push them to the wall, if, if I can block their exes good enough, they'll heat up and then they'll, they'll tip over, they'll flood and then they'll become super, I call them the Hulk. They'll hulk up, right? But what we're trying to do, um, the point is not to be a Jacqueline Hyde, right? Nor yeah. I don't know what the name of the character what was. The Hulk when he wasn't the Hulk. What was his name? Do you remember? Bruce Banner. Bruce Bruce Banner. There we go. Yeah. So they swim, they're between the Bruce and the Hulk, right? Yeah. What we want to get, I want to get to uh, to a third version of let's say Michael. Let's call him, right. where he could say, "Wow, I'm getting really triggered right now by you literally my my father, my yeah. parenting ability." Right. Like that's where I want I want to get you there, right. and I'll help your wife. Or your partner, whatever it is, to let that land, because the, the my approach there's so there's play, which is the lubricant of life. You'd be playful, not take yourself too seriously, and then the first step is owning your shit. What we spoke about. The second phase is letting things land, letting what your partner says in. Don't block it. Don't get defensive, and then say the thing. If you could do all of those three skills, that's the three skills you need to build a vibrant relationship: mm -hmm. owning your shit, letting things land, and saying the thing. The one directional one-dimensional communication and that's i don't remember different. what your question was yeah does that is that different are are, are are the steps the same i'm assuming they are no matter what country they're from um and is there a particular step that's i'm just this is just all my own curiosity that's so more this, difficult for one versus so i'll say for so i'll say for america like all men not all men, but i will find it men have it's hard for them to own their shit because they think their shit is their aggression the shadow of men is not our anger. That is our business card. <laughs> right. That's our that's our that's our tattoo all over our chest. That's what we've right. been socialized for. No, that's not your that's not your shadow, dude. Keep looking, okay? Yeah. I'd say for Israeli men, it's harder for them to let it land because we're much less polite in this country. Whereas I find that American men, part of that is yeah. that they won't cut off their partner. They'll let that partner speak, even if they're not fully listening. So they're a little bit calmer on the intake. Mm. Okay. Saying the thing for American men, it's harder because there's not a culture. It's so PC. Mm. And I can't just say, you know, it's really hard to say that. Now, it's even harder in today's generation with the Me Too that you're already seen as an aggressive baboon before you open your mouth. Yeah. So how can I find a way? And, and one of the reasons I need to be so playful as a therapist, because I work with women as well. And I, when I want to say to a woman, stop being a martyr. OK, you're not he's not jailing you. Mm. I have to be super playful because if I come on straight straight, I'm another abusive man. And she's already experiencing the abuse of men in her marriage. Like that's the, my, that's the advantage or disadvantage of being a male, male couple therapist. Mm. But I, I just like we think like, like that woman said, men are minutakim, they're emotionally detached, right? So that also lands on me. I'm also a man. So she's like, oh, a sales detached. He's just preaching. Here's another white man ex mansplaining my emotional feelings, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm saying all this because for you to be able, that's why you need to play. You need to be playful and you need to own your shit enough that you'll be able when you say something to your partner that you also know that you're saying it about yourself too. Like I just belittled you yesterday. You're right. I jabbed you at dinner table. I was like, you know, I made a joke at your expense and I own that. Yeah. Only if you own that, will you, you, will you have the legitimacy to say to her the following day, you know, the joke you cracked on my belly next to you with your girlfriend's kind of embarrassing to me. But you, you'll never be able to, to do that unless you own your shit first. And for a lot of men, we're expecting our wives to own their shit without us owning our shit. So what have, yeah. what have you done with that? Yeah. Agreed. I mean, you're a hypocrite. Uh, so I'm going to snag some questions here. Um, Please, this is great. So Kenneth says, what if, uh, and I think this is in, in terms of working on yourself in therapy, he said, what if the wife has already checked out? How does this help? With her already working on herself, is it possible that she will see you have changed to revert not necessarily back to marriage, but as friends? Okay, so here's the thing. Okay, and and I say this all the time. Even if you guys divorce, you will ha you will be co-parenting for the rest of your life. Yep. Full stop. Yep. So that that should be enough of a motivation to keep working on your relationship. 
and you're cooperating in communication. And we also need to realize this, that like, if you don't heal this, our kids are going to inherit that men are bitch, women are bitches and men are assholes. Like that, that, that split dichotomy or that men are mar or men are perfect and women are, are, are devils. Doesn't really matter. Like right now, our top priority is not to have our kids inherit very limited core beliefs. So the best you can do, Kenneth, right now is to enter a process with yourself, work on your shit, regardless of your ex. You're not doing it to get her back. You're not doing this to convince her. You're doing this to feel, I want more in my life. I deserve more in my life. And in my next marriage, maybe to this woman, but maybe to a different woman, I want to be a wider version of myself. Now, if you will do that work, you don't need to announce it to her. She will start feeling that in the communication. I, I do recommend, though, um, to do some sort of joint conjoined um, parental guidance just to make sure you're not triangulating the kids, sending them different messages. Mm. Uh, just say one thing about triangulation because it's super relevant for divorce. Triangulation is when two people can't get along, so we, we bring in a third person to mediate. Okay? All families do it, but what happens when you get to divorce, the kids become the kind of the UN. So I may, I crack jokes at women next to my son or about his mom, and I know that he's going to stick it to her later. It's like a time bomb. Or that I'll I'll pass my contempt on to my ex husband to my daughters, and when they visit him, they're gonna see how much of an idiot he is. And what happens is we're basically fucking up our kids because we don't know how to have a mature relationship or how to just be with our differences. Yeah, so, I, I, I want to I want to pause right there because there was a there was a gentleman in here a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I don't remember his name. I'm gonna call him fucking idiot, and okay. fucking idiot decided that because his ex bad mouthed him to his children that he felt he had free reign to do the same and i think that's just fucking idiotic can you please speak to that sir sure so if i teach i see this all the time so a lot of men will see women are manipulative right so he's probably passing on to his kid sons and daughters this the following core belief women are manipulative can't be trusted bitches whatever okay doesn't really matter those kids are gonna be loyal children and go look and look for those types of women so unless you wish your kids, I always, always ask men, do you wish your marriage to your kids? Do you wish your previous marriage to your kids? If the answer is yes, keep doing what you're doing. That's, that's, that should be your benchmark. If you want your kids to have the marriage you had, if you think your marriage is sababa, as we say in Arabic, is like great, by, by all means. But the second you poison your kids to feel better about yourself, you're basically making them loyal soldiers. But then they adopt a very narrow dichotomous perception of men and women and by the way, intimacy then becomes jail. Marriage is jail. So I don't ever want to get married. I don't ever want to have a ring on my finger. I don't want the ball and chain. No. So unless you wish your kids to either be miserably married or miserably single, if you want that, do what you're doing. Try and let your kids poison them, you know, do a coalition with the, against your ex. But if you want them to have a better chance at having a better life than you, you have got to find ways to express your anger and frustration, not to your children. Your children should not be your lovers. By the way, the most common affair is, is moms with their children. Everything they're not getting from you, they're going to get from their kids. That's the most common affair. But also men do that. Your kids are not your therapists and they're not your lovers. Mm. They're your children. You have to find, as soon as possible, a lateral move. Therapist, men's group, counselor, guide. Like, that's where all this shit should be going, not down. If you can't... Now, listen, I wanted to say one more thing about that. It's really hard not to do it. It's spillage. It's okay. But then own it but then own it such as I want to give an example. Um, last night, guys, uh, children like uh, Tim, whatever, Tim and Sarah and Beth, right. I was really angry after my conversation with mom. That's my bad. Hmm. Sometimes I get angry and then I kind of try to, you know, help you feel, see my side and be for me. But I realize that's not what you guys need. Like it's not enough, but it's a good first step of showing them. I'm not proud of what I did. Now, again, you can't do that over time. You can't like, you know, we call this shooting and crying, shooting and crying. No, right. stop shooting. Stop shooting, guys. It's not worth it. It's it's just, you're shooting yourself. You're not, you know, you're not shooting. Hey, you know, one more thing I want to say about this. You're not only shooting your children's foot, but you're shooting yourself in the foot. Why? Because in 20 years, they're going to look back and they're going to see you were such an asshole. Yeah. Because of you, dad, I didn't date or I was viciously just having sex with women. And, and it was, I was never in. Like, you don't want to turn around and be that guy that robbed them of a chance for a differentiated, mature relationship. Amen. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that because I, I agree. Um, Kenneth is asking another question about um, dating apps. He says, uh, how many people have been affected by dating apps? Uh, what he means is in today's society, we are so quick, 
grab the phone versus a conversation. Um, how do we, what do we men have to look forward to if this is a conflict we have in today's society? Uh, I think he's basically saying, um, you know, uh, has dating apps affected our ability to have good relationships? I mean, so that, that's, a, that's another topic. But we could have a whole session just about that. But I'll just say this briefly. Like, at the end of the day, um, the apps have become where we meet. We don't meet in bars anymore. Yeah. And unfortunately, because the real pandemic is men are assholes, core beliefs shared by humanity. If you approach women in the street, it's not, we're not in the 80s anymore. Like, right. people are scared. Women are scared, right? So, like, so the apps is just a reality we have to accept. Okay. Yeah. So now the question is, how can I, in the, as early as possible, bring bring my shadow earlier in, bring my authentic, my vulnerabilities? So it doesn't necessarily have to be in the profile. Hi, I'm uh, insecure. I have a small penis on my profile. No, <laughs> right. no. But you want to you want to find out. You want to kind of slowly trickle in as early as possible in the communication process, like your shadows, your insecurities. Like I think. I'm inviting, if you're on a dating app, try something different. Because if you only pretend to be strong, handsome, be beautiful, you're going you're gonna to get someone who's equally false, yeah. who's just showing you their best side. Right, right. So you want to find a way of bringing who you are, bringing your faults. You've learned that, like, and the, the advantage of you being a divorced man is you went through all this shit mm. already. So you don't have to pretend. You don't have to pretend. You, Stop you, faking it. Yeah. I think bad relationships are the problem, not dating apps, right? They, they might make it easier to end a bad relationship, but it's not, they're not causing the end of relationships. I, I don't believe, I, th I think maybe it's, it's making it easier to end them, giving them an alternative perhaps or whatever. But at the end of the day, if your relationship sucks, it has nothing to do with the dating app, right? Wrong. Wow. I'd say this. I'd say, in general, I think people are more lazy and they want it. I want it beautiful, right? Well, I don't want to suffer in a job for, like my dad, 40 years in the same job. If, if you suck it up, okay? But the, sh the, the shadow side of that is like any difficulty in my marriage, I'm like, bye bye. I want a new marriage. Because yeah. again, we didn't see our parents. Like, why do you want to get remarried to the same partner? Because you can't, they, you, they already know you. So you get to discover a whole new dimension. It's like a Mario Brothers, you go ding, ding, and you enter another dimension, right? right. So, the thing is, like, it's bringing back this concept of meaningful endurance, that going through conflict is good. That's how you grow because relationships are sloppy because conflict is an inevitable part of every relationship. So if I can reframe and realize meaningful endurance, I can grow more in a relationship than out of a relationship. I can be dating and having sex with tons of women, but I will not be challenged. I will not grow. So if you want to grow and discover more, because at the end of the day, you can have sex with a mate with hundreds of women, but I'll, I can say from my story, like, being single and having just a lot of women, I felt so empty after the evening was over. What was the point? And now what? Yeah. There was this question. I was like, and now is this it? Yeah. So I, I, I orgasm and then I kind of lie down. I turn around. Who is this woman? What am I doing here? Right. Right. Yeah. And, and I think what I want to say is like, it's not about the apps. It's about going back to meaningful endurance, just like we do in the gym. No pain, no gain. That's the same thing in relationship. And if I can use relationships, one, one last thing about this, as a way to grow myself. I want to reframe, take relationship as a stage, as a practicum, as an oven, as a gym for you to grow and discover more sides about yourself. How can they be even more vulnerable, even more present, yeah. even more open, even more joyous? That is everyone in my life, my kids, my wife, they're all um, supporting actors in the movie that's called My Life. And in my life, I want to feel more free. Agreed. Um, uh, we got, we're going to shift a bit. Uh, Scott has a question. Is it possible to limit his son learning bad ways of dealing with emotions from his mom. I know I have no control over that, but I worry about him picking on that up on that from her. Um, I'll try to get him to think it's okay, but she has a view of men shouldn't cry. I want him to know it's okay. Wow. Uh, first of all, let me just, let me just let that land for a second. So we're, here's a beautiful example again, um, of men, women thinking that men shouldn't cry. So here's the good news and the bad news. The bad news is you have no control over what he's going to hear from his mom. Yeah. And all you can really do is model a different type of man. Yeah. And when he'll be older, because um, if you start bad mouthing his mom, then once again, you're triangulating them. Yeah. And then they have, they're in a lose-lose position, right? Who do I love more, daddy or mommy? Right. And if I, if, I don't like mo if I don't agree with daddy, I'm loving mom. Like, you right. don't want them to feel this double loyalty. So all you can do, and it hurts, and it's really frustrating, is to keep modeling that men can cry. And when you do cry, by the way, tell your kids why. Mm. 
So I'll tell my kids when I'm crying, I'm crying because I'm sad. I'm crying because I'm lonely. I'm crying because I'm happy. Yeah. I'm crying because uh, I just feel like I want to love you more, but I've inherited this core belief that children are a burden and I don't want to see you guys as a burden because I'm experimenting because I grew up in a house full of secrets. I don't want to hold back from my kids. And my kids know my struggle with boys are bad or hurt or sad and the children are a burden because that's a core belief that I inherited. You know, you said kids are, what, what was yours, what was yours, Michael? Uh, my oldest are... 13 and seven. No, but what was your word when I said children are? Oh, uh, ha- happy, I think I said. Right. So for me, I grew up with children are, children are, bur- are a burden, right? Mm. So what you can do is, Scott, is you can start modeling that and explain that and consistently model that. And that they will come, well, they will realize, oh, actually, but daddy cries. Oh, so I want to look for a man that can cry like daddy. So a- actions are, are always louder than words, right? Because the second you start talking about mom, you're triangulating. And that's never... The, right. What I could suggest actually is organizing a session, a parental guided session, where you can express those concerns. Mm. And by the way, but also be open for her concerns because she might think you're giving them bad eating habits. For instance. Right. So you want to model owning your shit and letting it land before you can say the thing. Mm. And if you consistently reach out your arm to your ex and you're saying to her, listen, there's gaps. I'd like us to bridge it over. One day she might say yes. I'm just thinking about my situation. I, I don't. I don't speak to mine very much. Um, I don't, I'm not mean to her though, either. Um, it's just, a, a, a she gets a silence from me and I, I know, that's know not, wait, I, I, yeah, go there, yeah, go there. Michael. Yeah. Say it, I know, say I know, it, I know it's not the, the, the best way to handle things. I, I'm, I'm aware of this, but it's safe. Um, but that, I mean, and that's how it's been for me. My life, that was probably a core issue in my marriage was my silence because it was safe. Um, because that's what I learned during childhood. Um, if yeah. I would, if I, if I could, disappear disassociate by what didn't exist and i couldn't be attacked uh mentally verbally physically and 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 so that's what i've learned and, and i'm continuing that and and I'm, I'm acutely aware um that it's not the best way to handle things but uh i the thing that i lean on i suppose is well at least i'm not arguing <laughs> so that's but then, but then once again, yeah but then we're in fight or flight right so either i'm arguing or i'm dissociated yes and, and part of what you're gonna have to learn michael you and your friends or whoever it is it doesn't have to be specifically about you like we no, have to learn a way to to be able to stay in the heat without either arguing or running away yeah and like i think we all I, i'm glad that you're saying this because it's clear to us that for your girls it, it's in your sake if you want your girls to have a better marriage than you guys had sooner or later you will have to talk to her because you by you not talking to their mom you're sending them a message that women are impossible hmm. That, that the only, like, it, it's either fight or flight. That's basically right. what you're modeling to them, right? Because you don't have to say that to them. They know they're not idiots. They know that you're not talking to their mom or that your mom's not talking to your, like, they know that. So then in their mind, they're like, why? Oh, I guess it's impossible for men and women to talk about right. things they don't agree with. It's either explosion. Um, some, some bad stuff. It's either a bunker or right. it's an explosion, right? right. Like that. Yeah. So, so. So there's so you're owning your shit. You're realizing that, but sooner or later, men in your position need to learn to co- cross the bridge again. So to show you our daughters, that men and women can stay in the same heated space without either going bunker or explosion. Yeah, yeah, it's a skill I have I have not yet. Uh, Tell me, you're a work in progress. Oh, uh, we all yeah. are. Yeah, uh, a yeah. couple more, uh, a few more here. Let's see what. Uh, Yay. Al wants to know, um, this one, I don't, this might be a topic for, for another day and another person, but um, when you're, uh, the, the ex refuses to co-parent and keeps trying to alienate your children, are there any good resources that could help? Um, okay, so, so I'll just, I'll say that. That's, a, that's another huge topic. Like yeah. parental alienation is huge and it's real yeah. and it, it goes on both sides and that requires professional help. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say also because a lot of times when we're hurt, we're like, my wife is poisoning our kids. Like right. sometimes it's our subjective experience. I'm just putting that as a caveat. Yeah. If you really are concerned about that, it is time to turn immediately fast to counseling, starting with a school counselor. Yeah. Um, cause that's real. And that needs to be processed. Now, again, it's hard for me to say, cause it's only his opinion. If you feel like that, it's time to find a counselor. And it also say for a lot of couples, by the way, um, I've noticed that when the husband says, um, you feel free to choose someone that you trust for the wife, let's say. The partner oftentimes will, will, will be more open to the idea of doing some work together if they get to choose the counselor. And perhaps the first place to start is school because both of you, the school is the one place where you guys will meet. 
-hmm. And perhaps school counselor could be a really good point of saying, okay, because if there's real alienation, the kid's going to develop symptoms relatively fast. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's just, and the rest we'll talk about in a different answer. Yeah. Um, Charlie's asking about um, the emotional affair with, with kids. Is this a common issue in marriage? Um, he thinks that uh, that was the case in his marriage. <laughs> if you're a four to six, sir, there's a high probability your wife is having an affair with your children hmm. because they're giving her the warmth and the love and the tears and all the things that you don't have because you're a four to six. So you're a baboon. So why? Yeah. So I've obviously the kid has nightmares and is coming to sleep with you in bed obviously right. because she much rather spoon her son than you so yes that's a real thing and the, the more limited and stunted you are the more by the way this works for both genders right yeah. so you're going to look for someone yeah. uh, by the way uh, the most common affair of the man is his work hmm. i'll stay i'll work overtime even though i don't get paid for overtime because at work people actually enjoy me and actually listen to me because i'm the boss or because i'm meaningful Right. And I feel more competent when I come at home. I feel this big. So, yes, I will spend another hour work. I won't rush home. Of course. Why would you? So that's your affair. Yeah. Right. We all have affairs. It's called exits. We exit. Right. We have no you know, the golf, football, drugs, porn, work. Right. Uh, Scott was asking about uh, he, he asked about um, his, his wife sort of uh, not thinking uh, men should cry. He's wondering if he should talk with his uh, son's therapist about that particular issue. Okay, so here's what about. Okay, so if your kids are in therapy, at least in Israel, and I hope this is also in the States happening, every so often the therapist should invite the parents to kind of a parental guidance kind of thing. Um, I think that should be transparent. Um, and you got to make sure that the kid knows that the therapist is going to see the parents. And then they, the therapist and the kid need to discuss what is being talked and whatnot. Because what you don't want to have is a double secret. Because if the kid loses faith in the therapist, it's done. He's not going to go to therapy again. Mm. And here's another mind, boy that will become a man that think that therapy is shit. Right. So everything has to be transparent. And yes, then I would highly recommend speaking and finding a way, hopefully both parents, even if you guys don't meet at the same time. But if the therapist is meeting the chan, like it would be a really good place for that therapist to kind of hear the voices and start helping that. By the way, I'll just say as a couple of family therapists, I started doing therapy with kids and then I stopped because I said, I, I don't want to do I don't want to do this. I don't want to talk to kids and then parents. So my biggest recommendation is family therapy, obviously, even if you're just going with your kids, like even if I'm going with my kids and not with my ex and the kids, at least there I can model. And then next to my kids, I can cry and I can say how difficult, how scared I am, yeah. how I know I should be talking to your mom, but it's hard for me. Yeah. Like that is something they need to be hearing to normalize that, to explain why mommy and daddy are not talking and that it's not something I'm proud of. Like, I don't want, and again, like, and, and this, I'm, I'm owning my shit as a couple of family therapists. Like, if I was a psychodynamic therapist, I'd be giving different answers, but I really truly believe in this. Like, I don't work with teenagers at all. I, teenagers want to come, come with your parents, mm. come with your parents. Cause like, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be the call girl for their emotional life. It's not sustainable. You want to be that person. I want your son to open up to you. And by, I'll be the, I'll be the doula. I'll be the math, the MC of that, but that's where we want to be going. Right. And if you don't know how to talk to your kids, go into family therapy, learn, you know, go into the crucible, get stuck with words, have a, have a therapist scaffold and help you give the options or go to a men's group. But you need to do the work. Do not outsource to another female therapist who will love your children the way you can't. And then once again, they think that men are incapable, incapable of living because fathers are overrated. Like we're trying to prevent that. You can't fix it all, my friend. Uh, ah! I, <laughs> I try to. Um, uh, Charlie asked another question about can a family function when the wife is the sole authority on literally everything and the husband has adapted to keep the peace but resents having no voice? Well, I, I mean, no, of course not. It's the majority of families in Israel and the States are like that. Yeah. Right. Where that is that is the pandemic, right? Yeah. The four to six covertly depressed man. Yes, that can change. The question is who's more suffering and who it never happens together. Usually one partner has enough and wants to change. Right. But then they have to risk it all because you might not have another marriage with that woman. Are you willing to risk it all? It's high risk, high gain, like an improv, high risk, high gain. Are you willing to to maybe sacrifice the marriage so you can be, be more of yourself? Because right now, if that's what you're playing, if that's the role you're playing at home, then that's what your kids are learning about men. Is that what is that? Yeah. Is that the man you want your daughter to marry? Yeah. 
That shit's deep, my friend. That yeah. Is, yeah. It, hurt, it hurts. It hurts, but I mean, it does. Up. Well, I think, but, yeah. listen, we're all fallible. We're all, we're all, we're all human. We all fuck up. We all were, uh, had poor models for relationships. It's not like our parents knew what the fuck they were doing either. Right. No. Um, we're, we're much more, uh, learned, uh, than, than they are. Um, it's just, it is hard to put some of these things into practice. It is, it's hard to take a look at yourself. It's hard to be honest. It's hard to do the work. And that's why I think so many, and maybe women are as guilty too. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure, but I think it's why people, men don't want to do the work because it's, it's really fucking hard. It's a lot easier to dive into porn, sex, alcohol, drugs, sports, work, whatever. That's a lot easier than actually sitting in therapy and saying, um, you know, I don't know. I feel like I don't, I I'm all alone in the world or what, or what the fuck ever. Um, right. that's, that's a lot. It, it's a lot right. easier to just be like, fuck it. I'm going to go hit the bar and, and drink numbness, yeah. numbness. Yeah. It's easier yeah. for me not to feel when I am numb. I'm in my happy place. Yes. Yes. We are, we are covertly depressed. This is a real pandemic. This is not a joke. Yeah. And yes, yes, this is worldwide. This is, we're seeing this in the media. You know, everybody loves Raymond. Al Bundy, the classical covertly male depressed, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's where we are. That's where we are, yeah. unfortunately. And we, and, and we have, it's going to have, it's not going to happen from the media. It's going to happen with men listening to this podcast. Like you, you're a classic example, Michael. Life has kicked you in the ass and forced mm -hmm. you. You would have, we, we would have never have met mm -hmm. and had this conversation if you hadn't gone through that divorce. Hundred percent, thousand percent. Right. So, right. So, is it shit? Yeah, it's, I'm shit. It's really shitty that it happened, but did it change your life? Yes. Are you a better man? Hopefully. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a work in progress, like we said earlier, and I think we all are. But there's no right, question but, but that I, I, I know more. <laughs> I'm smarter about uh, emotions. About. Um, uh, feelings and how to process things and how to be honest with myself and how to relate. And I mean, if there's so many things that I've learned, it's, uh, it's definitely in, in a, in a way is, is made my life better. It's, it is still tough to wrap your head around that. It, it's, it's a trauma. Better. It's a scar. Yeah. It's a yes. scar, but you, you are a much better role model to your daughter than you've ever been. A hundred percent. No, and I think, no and question. I, and I think anyone listening to this podcast can take you, Michael, as an example that even though it hurts and it pains and there's still trauma and you're still not talking to your ex, you have your your emotional range has widened, your awareness has widened, and you're modeling a different type of man, not only for your daughter, but for all the listeners. And I and I want to commend you the fact that you're not a PhD or a therapist, that you're a real man doing this journey. I'll tell you why, because you know, people say to me, when I, when I say I have a tattoo of feel on my arm, but well, it's because you're a therapist. No, because I'm an idiot. Because I'm a, you know, an, a, a baboon, a four to sixer that chose a profession that forces me to meet myself. And, and like, I think that is where we're going. And I think, Michael, it's, it's men like you. I could talk to more men that don't feel like I'm preaching. Because if Dr. Romanelli says it and Michael says it, they're going to hear it from you much easier. Yeah. Uh, but, but we, it's, but we it's, can't just, we can't, but we can't just stop with support group for divorced men. The yeah. last phase of that is to help these men re-enter relationships and realize that women are not the enemy because then we're just we're just transferring the shit another generation. Very true. That's where we're going. That's where we're going. Well, uh, Dr. Romanelli, uh, SIL. Now I think yeah. I've nailed, I think I've nailed that uh, pronunciation. I feel good about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to thank you. Uh, there, there is a last question. Uh, one that um, I ask everyone, and that is what words uh, of wisdom would you impart to a man who's just starting his divorce process? Ah, <sighs> Let me, let me let, let, I want to let that land for a second. What's my limit? Like one word or like one phrase? You can you can go on for ten more minutes. <laughs> We've been going on for like almost two hours. Yeah. Um, okay. I'd say this. I'd say this. I'd say this. I'd say this. Buckle up. Hmm. I'm advantage. I'm inviting you to see this as the the threshold, passing the threshold in a hero's journey. Are you ready to welcome your next evolution? This is an invitation from the universe for you to evolve. Are you going to say yes to the challenge? And are you willing to step into the unknown? I'm going back to, to the hero's journey model. We'll talk about that in another episode. Or this is an invitation for you to evolve, to become a better man for yourself, first of all, and then for your children. So it's not a disastrous opportunity. Uh, that was... Uh... That was awesome. That was that was inspiring. Honestly, it was really, really. It made me want to go conquer the world. I gotta be honest with you. 
uh, made me pretty emotional. <laughs> um, um, how can people find you, sir, Dr. Ron, okay. sir? Uh, what's the best way to, to contact you, to find your content, sure. all the good stuff? So thank you for asking that. So I have uh, a YouTube channel. It's called The Potential State, where me and my wife, uh, we, we have over 120 episodes. Each one of them about seven minutes long with a like a nugget of theory, like let it land, say the thing on your shit and some exercise. It's also a podcast called The Potential State. You can also find us in potentialstate.com where we do webinars. We do, I, we do online counseling. Um, and I am happy to support you guys on your journey. There's tons of free content on the website, YouTube podcast. There's a blog on psychology today called The Other Side of Relationships. That's how me and you met, Mike, by the way, Michael. Yes. So you can yes. check that out on psychology today. And like I said, potentialstate.com. Awesome. And we'll put all the info in the link, I guess. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll post it in the show notes. I'll put it. Uh, it'll be in the transcript, of course. Uh, it'll be on the website, all the good stuff. Uh, thank you so very, very much for doing this. I really, really appreciate Thanks, it. Michael. Yeah, and we will absolutely do it again sometime. No problem. Take all care, right. everyone. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching and or listening. Thank you to Nick Coyle and Lifer for allowing me to use their song, Born Again, which you're hearing now and at the intro to the podcast. Thank you to Justin Dillahanty and all of my brothers at The Alpha Code. Please visit the website, risingphoenixpodcast.com, to connect with me and other like-minded men who are looking to thrive and grow after their divorce. And remember to surround yourself with people who add value to your life, who challenge you to be greater than you were yesterday, who sprinkle magic into your existence like you do to theirs. Life is not meant to be done alone. Find your tribe. Take care.